Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me uh, for this talk. I am the VP of Engineering at a startup called Together AI. Um, and I'd like to talk today about why we believe open source is the future of LLMs and the future of AI, as well as a couple of things that we found a little surprising as we tried to scale out access to all of these open source large language models. Um, first, a little bit about Together. Uh, we are a research-driven AI company trying to bring state-of-the-art uh, research around optimization and building the most efficient uh, infrastructure for large language models and AI in general. And we're a young company, um, but we're actually based off of decades of research done by our founders here, um, which include professors at Stanford, at ETH, and probably like the best example of uh, research is Flash Attention, which was done by Tree Dow over there, um, and is used by pretty much anybody doing LLMs right now um, to optimize their training loops. Um, as I mentioned earlier, at Together, we fundamentally believe that open source is the future of AI. Um, we don't think that there's going to be just a single commercial model to rule them all. We think there's going to be a lot of leading models, and a lot of them are going to be open source. And the reason for that is uh, three things, really. I think the first is transparency. Um, anybody who is uh, investing significantly in these large language models is going to want transparency to understand like, how, the model, how the model is behaving. In particular, they're going to want to know what data was the model trained on, um, what methods were used for training the model, um, and like, how is the mo what, what is the model quality. Um, and this is important for things like you know, model risk management and model review boards and so forth. Um, and that is partly why we've also partnered really closely with the Stanford Center for um, Research and Foundation Models to develop Helm. Um, Helm is this benchmark um, that can benchmark 119 different models across lots of different scenarios and just produce metrics across all these models to see how they actually are behaving and performing. So the second reason we think that the future of LLMs is open source is because con of control. So again, if you've invested heavily into these large language models, um, I think as a lot of us know, these large language models may actually hallucinate uh, issues and you, know, you may put one in production and all of a sudden it's like hallucinating in production with, it, with all of your customers. Um, and so open source models actually give you a lot, of, a lot more control over um, the behavior of these models. You know, if it's not doing what you want it to do, then you can do a full fine tune of the open source model. Um, you control when you deploy the model to production and when you want to uh, deploy updates to, to uh, your customers. Um, and you can actually just download the model and just deploy it anywhere you choose on your own infrastructure um, or anywhere in the cloud. Like with open source models, like you own the model. And then lastly, like the reason why I believe that um, open source is kind of the future of large language models is because of privacy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like you could take the model, you could deploy it on your own infrastructure. Um, you can also use your own infrastructure for training these models and fine tuning these models. Um, so you can, main, you can keep control over all the fine tuning data that you're using, all the input prompts that your model is seeing in production from your users, um, all the responses from the models, um, and any other user data that you're using uh, that you feed into the models. Um, so for all these reasons, uh, we believe that open source is actually going to be the future of large language models. Um, and so what we've done at Together is um, we provided, one of the things that we've done is we provided a service where anybody can go to our website, get an API key, um, and start using any of 100 plus open source large language models. Um, we added just like Mixtral support um, earlier this week, for example. Um, and what I'd like to talk about now is some of the things that, some of the issues that we ran into trying to scale out this service um, that's serving all of these open source large language models. Um, and, it's, and I just want to talk about four simple things, um, four things that we kind of found surprising to us at least um, as we tried to scale this out. Um, and those are auto scaling and startup, bin packing and robustness, timeouts and keep alive, and continuous batching. Um, so to start with, when we're hosting this many models um, in production, um, 
we want to actually auto scale with our demand. So if we don't want to actually run every single model um, at peak demand at peak capacity all the time, um, and this actually is incredibly challenging. Um, and one thing that is Im really important to solve uh, when we're auto scaling is model startup. Um, so that together we actually have our own inference stack um, that we uh, that runs the inference for all of these models. Um, and we spent a lot of time just trying to optimize that stack, optimize that startup time, um, get it to load the models as quickly as possible and get ready to serve traffic. Um, and what we found, which was a little bit surprising, is that um, that actually was not the biggest part of the startup problem. Um, actually, the startup time was dominated much more by just downloading the models. Um, because the models actually can be fairly large. A 70 billion parameter model is like 140 gigabytes. Um, and when you have like thousands of GPUs and you have to send all this data to all of the workers and all of the, all the services, that actually starts to dominate kind of that startup time. Um, and so one of the things that we had to do there is just to make sure that we were really smart about caching things, caching, caching the models like close to our GPUs, um, both within the same data center and on each of the instances, um, and also be really smart about just kind of like predicting where we should pre-cache things. Like if a model is gonna be really popular, then just push that model to as many places as you can. Um, so that was a little bit surprising to us. Um, the, second, uh, the second thing that actually caught us a little bit by surprise was bin packing versus, versus robustness. So there was this trade-off um, between robustness um, and actually being able to auto-scale some of our models. Um, so imagine that you're running a bunch of small 7B models that maybe take one or two GPUs each. Uh, if you want a robust service, then you would spread out those models on as many machines as you can, and each machine may have like eight GPUs. Um, but then also imagine that you're running a large 70 GB model that might want all eight GPUs on a machine. Um, when it comes time to try to scale up that 70 B model, it may not be able to find a machine to run on because you've actually spread out all the small models across all the machines and you can't find a whole machine to run on anymore. Um, so that ended up being really tricky for us as well. Um, we had to set different priorities um, so that if we try to scale up a 70B model that we would get kick off some of the smaller models and just try to bin pack um, in order to maintain both robustness um, and efficiency there. Uh, the third thing that kind of caught us by surprise and um, that we had to actually spend a lot of time on is just timeouts. Um, so one of the things about these large language models is that the requests can take a very long time. Um, end to end, you know, with the, uh, from, the, from the first byte until the last, last byte of the response, it could be tens of seconds, um, sometimes like hundreds of seconds, depending on whether you're sending like a huge prompt or not. Um, and this is very different from kind of typical like web traffic or typical internet service. Um, and so what we found is that every single part of the path actually needed um, some specific tuning on timeouts. Um, in order for us to both um, make sure that we didn't throw errors with our customers and make sure that we could take best advantage of the persistent connections, the HTTP keep alive connections um, throughout, the, throughout the entire path. Um, and so the trick there was we had to just map out the entire data path and make sure that the timeouts were getting progressively longer and set progressively longer throughout the whole path. Um, and finally, I wanna talk about continuous batching. Um, a lot has been written with continuous batching about how fast continuous batching is with to in terms of tokens per second and how much it can reduce um, latency. Um, but what we found was that uh, continuous batching was really essential for us uh, just so that we could handle multiple requests per, per server. Um, like without batching in general, like if every GPU could only take one request at a time, um, there was no way we would have enough capacity to serve all the traffic that, that uh, we need to serve. Um, and so like continuous batching was just essential just to even just make a scalable service in the first place. Um, so that's, uh, those were just a, a small sampling of uh, the, the surprises that we ran into trying to scale out the service and hopefully that um, maybe helps like you guys avoid, avoid some of those if you end up having to scale it yourself. Um, 
And again, like here at Together, you know, we're providing this service uh, to bring these open source models to the masses because you know, we believe that uh, the future of AI is open source um, for, those, for better transparency, better control, and better privacy. Uh, thank you.